found in the famous and controversial Sefer Yehezkel, Periklamet Zion Pasuk Tet Vav through um, Chav Chet, which is Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 15 through 28. Now, this is the famous and supposedly eschatological Perik that depicts both kingdoms, Ephraim and Yehuda, once again being united as one in the famous statement regarding the two sticks. And friends, people don't stop there. Even the church has used this chapter to justify all types of nonsense. Even the Mormons have pretty much used this chapter to justify not only them having a new Bible, but virtually their religion as well. Heck, even the erroneous concept of Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David stem from this parak, right, according to the Malbim and other Mephorshim. In other words, friends, this chapter poses a lot of heavy questions that unfortunately come with very heavy answers, which makes one think why it is actually only safe for Yehesko that Chaza ever prohibited in appearing as one of the Haftarot. Well, at least a few portions within it, but actually not this one. Or it really makes you think that if all this controversy is why Chazal did not want to include this whole Sefer in what later became the Jewish canon. But initially were just this forum that were mitame yadayim. But regardless, friends, as you know, before we begin any portion of the Hebrew Scriptures, that context is king. However, friends, it is in this area of context where Sefer Yehezkel loses its audience from one perspective, while at the same time, it is also in this area of context where Yehezkel could be used to perhaps test the limits of rabbinic hermeneutics. Now, friends, today I'm not going to cover on how Yehezkel could prophesy in Bava when prophecy could only be given in Eretz Israel because Chazal have already in some way come up with an answer for that. Or in any way touch on the parable regarding the Jewish people that Chazal considered basically pornographic or on how Yehezkel could be in two places in once, right? Both in Bava and in Eretz Israel, virtually at the same time because many have given suggestions for that. And I'm for sure not going to speak about his account of the Merkava, the controversial outlawed portion that hands down laid down the framework for virtually every mystical movement post the Anshe Knesset HaGedola, which were, according to the Talmud, the guys who actually wrote the books of Ezekiel. Yes, the books, the Gemara, as well as Josephus allude to the idea that Sefer Yehezkel, uh, was initially two books, which if one carefully studies what we have today, makes a lot of sense. But again, this is for another lecture. No, friends. Today we're covering Haftarat Vayigash, which deals again with the 37th chapter of Sefer Yehezko. And this parak begins describing the famous story of the two sticks, one representing Judah and the other representing Ephraim, the two dominant tribes of their time, which acted like the spokesmen for the other remaining tribes that they split between each other. Now, this has been used many times to describe the Almighty in some way compelling the lost northern tribes to in some way return to Israel in some sort of ingathering of the exiles, a concept and term that religious Zionists constantly coin. And a concept that has not only inspired dozens of Midrashim, but countless ideologies such as the Evangelical Two-House Movement, and like we said earlier, the concept of Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. All these notions have their roots in this parak. But again, to give you a quick summary of what is going on in this Haftarah, like I do with all my scriptural analysis, I will put the commentaries aside and only try to understand the portion according to what we can see contextually in the Sefer. On the principle of Ein Mikar Yotzemete Peshuto. So again, the Almighty tells Yehezko to gather two sticks, one to represent the kingdom of Judah and then the other to represent the kingdom of Ephraim, which is really synonymous with Yosef. Now, it seems that the two sticks, apart from just representing the two kingdoms, is in some way acting like two scepters, right? Two symbols of power. Then it states that when the people ask Yehesko about the sticks, that he should tell them that the Lord will make these two sticks one, telling them that the people of Israel will not be known as a split entity anymore, but rather, after this next redemption, Israel will be one. And then it goes on to say... This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their land. Okay? And this, 
for those who study Torah is no surprise because this is what the Torah states, right? In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and in Leviticus chapter 26, that Hashem will bring us back when we repent, of course, my friends. And this is really in terms of this Haftarah is where the problem begins, at least for the vast majority of uh, religionists out there. The problem in assuming that this is in some way stating that after the destruction of the second temple, the exile that we are in now, that God is telling us that he is in some way not only going to compel us to return to the land, but even gather the non-existent lost tribes along with them or along with us. I mean, you've heard it quoted hundreds of times that what we see occurring in the modern state of Israel is prophecy being fulfilled. And they will point to the Jews from India and Ethiopia and even China. And then they will quote this verse. But regardless, friends, I assure you that after you are done listening to this shiur, you will realize that this, at least how it's understood, today is nowhere in the narrative. And um, another portion within Ezekiel chapter 37 that adds to the confusion is the beginning of the chapter, which is not part of Haftarat Vayigash, but it is still very much connected to the big picture. And that is the famous story of the dry bones. Now here Rashi, in some way, quoting a Midrash, teaches that this is an actual valley of Israelite bones. And when for many reasons, this for sure was just a vision, not to mention that Jews have a law to bury and intern bones. But regardless, nowhere, nowhere in the text does it tell you that this is speaking about the lost tribes. Again, besides the Midrash that tells you that it's speaking about pre-Sinai Ephraim. Actually, the dry bones is symbolic to exiled Israel. And when the Almighty tells Yeheskel to prophesy over them, to prophesy over the dry bones, he's basically telling him, to do so just as he will prophesy over Israel. And what prophecy does he actually bring in this Sefer? Right? Is it prophecies of just promises, peace, and joy? Absolutely not, my friends. But words to instill repentance because this is the formula laid down in Torah. In other words, the formula we see in Torah and how Hashem deals with our disobedience is disobedience equals prophetic intervention, right? That's Yehesko's role. And if they don't change, galut, exile. And then when they turn back, right, repentance, this equals redemption. And it's very clear and simple in Torah. So by Yehesko prophesying and Israel hearing the message and making teshuvah, the bones come alive. It then states, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. In other words, the graves was their spiritual reality, unless you really think that the Creator would forcibly bring them to Israel just because of their DNA without even repenting. And how do we know that this is not what Yehesko meant? Well, apart from not being the Torah model, Yehesko says it himself in the 14th parak, right? Where he reminds us that there is no salvation through vicarious merit. In other words, only because you have Israelite DNA, the Almighty is not just going to bring you back to Israel, right? It states in the 14th parak of Sefer Yehesko that the word of the Lord came to me, the Son of Man, that if a country sins against me by being unfaithful, unfaithful to Torah, and I stretch out my hand against it, to cut off its food supply and send famine upon it and kill its people and their animals, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they could save only themselves by their righteousness, declares the Sovereign Lord. In other words, blood is not enough, my friends. Tell that to all these religious Jewish and Christian Zionists who believe that the Almighty is in some way going to compel people with Israelite DNA worldwide to in some way, in a zombie-like state, return to Israel. And this is why Judaism today and its offshoots make no ethical sense. And why we're losing droves of people. Because nowadays, Judaism paints an image of an unethical God who favors people just because of DNA and not belief and behavior. In other words, if Israel, no matter where they are, are buried, no matter who their descendants are, 
If they did not repent, they will not be brought back. And many in seeing this problem and at the same time claiming to be religious, but not from ethnic Jewish stock, will say something to the like of, the reason I'm coming back in the first place or choosing to be religious must be because I have the soul of a Jew, i.e. I am the reincarnation of a dead Israelite. An idea that groups like Chabad and even the Messianic or the Evangelical Messianic two-house movement uses to justify current-day non-Jews coming to Judaism. Ultimately making Judaism and Jews look ridiculous, basically stating that Torah and Judaism is not meaningful enough to attract newcomers on its own. No, that the people from outside who end up coming in only come in because they had Jewish souls compelling them to do so. But anyways, friends, as you will see, you don't have to read it that way. You don't need to have secularists call you a bigot. You could approach these chapters from a Torah perspective using the... Torah principles, and especially the main Torah principle that applies to anything you may read in the books of the prophets, and that's that the role of the prophet was only to bring Israel back to Torah. Again, friends, that the role of the prophet was only to bring Israel back to Torah, and not to, in any way, create new metaphysical realities. And what happens when we don't let Torah lead us? Easy, we fracture Judaism. Not to mention that this fracturing is what gave birth to the notion of the resurrection of the dead and laid down and solidified the foundation of what came to be known as salvation, which created Christianity. And you're probably noticing that I didn't say Lahavdil there. But again, this purely ethnic redemption is not what it's referring to, and not just because Torah does not condone such a redemption. In other words, one without a sincere teshuvah. But like we read it in the 14th parak of Sefer Yeheskel, that Yeheskel himself doesn't condone it either. In other words, every word of this haftarah was already fulfilled. Did you hear what I just said? That every word in this haftarah was already fulfilled, not to mention virtually 99% of what people consider end-time prophecy was, my friends, already fulfilled or expired. And if you're wondering, what do I mean by fulfilled or expired? Friends, let me ask you, where and when was Yehesko prophesying from? Yes, friends, he was in the vicinity of Bovel, in Galut, in what was known as the Babylonian exile, i.e. before the second temple was built. In other words, the redemption that he is describing or was describing in this parak already occurred, and after that redemption, Israel was never known as two separate entities again, as the prophecy stated. And one could even say that Zerubbabel could have been David, being that he in some way filled the role for a short time when he ruled in the new kingdom of Israel. And regarding when it states, when my sanctuary is among them forever, friends, you must understand that the term Leolam almost always means for a long time and not forever. And I would even go further and say that the temple that he prophesies at the end of Sefer Yehesko is actually the second temple, not the third. Again, mainly because, remember, he is in Bovel. He even lives during the destruction of the first temple. So why on earth would he speak about some third temple when the second temple wasn't even built yet? Now, you're probably wondering, how about Ezekiel's temple measurements that didn't line up with the measurements of the later built second temple? Look, that's not our problem. We'll call it human error, maybe because, again, we know who wrote these books, or call it whatever you choose to call it or choose to do with it. However, what you shouldn't do is in some way build new metaphysical notions on it just because we find potential errors within it. And honestly, friends, why would any Jew be of the notion that an error could not have crept into one of the books of the prophets when Jews, unlike Christians, again, know very well that it was our sages who wrote and compiled these books and not the breath of God. Actually, there are, there are other misconstrued notions found in the safer that people hold to mean something that it really doesn't. And honestly, if you look at it carefully, their claims aren't really there. Things that I haven't mentioned in this video, like Gog and Magog and the Christian understanding of Satan and a few others. And friends, before I close, I need to tell you that you need to stop studying Tanakh like a Christian and know that the only reason these books were compiled in the first place was only to give Jews an ability to remember Torah when the study of Torah was outlawed by the Syrian Greeks. In other words, the key was always Torah. 
Friends, the purpose of these books, again, are only to amplify Torah, which means that if you do not feel comfortable about the way some group is interpreting a certain parak, read it again for yourself, and 9 out of 10 times you will see that agenda has compromised the historical contextual narrative. And friends, for more information about anything and everything Jewish, please visit bejewish.org. Thank you. Thank you.